So I'm going to talk about, uh, um, uh, I'm just going to illustrate my uh, talk with a few cases uh, in the context of acute infection. I'm not talking about chronic infection and things like that. So this is a straightforward case, five and a half year old child who presented with all clear signs of uh, acute osteomyelitis um, in her left leg. Uh, was diagnosed well in the um, um, tier 2 CT, but they didn't want to have any surgery there and then came over with uh, these kind of findings. So at presentation, you don't see any changes in the plane radiograph, although you can still see because this was about 7, 10 days. Uh, clear findings, systemic signs as well as uh, uh, clinical signs as well as corroborative signs. Not just uh, uh, infection, the whole leg was tense. Um, and as you can see, the reason for the tense compartment is that the infection had, the abscess had burst into the soft tissues. So it was not just a bone infection, it was potential neurovascular compromise with the tense compartment. So nothing controversial here. You would go ahead and decompress it, send the specimens off a culture, identify the organism, start her on appropriate antibiotics. The bit that you may tend to forget in all of this is protecting the limb. Okay? So that is why, that's the key. Thing. You treat your infection well, do, do the, all the necessary surgery, but protect the limb. And why is that important? So that's two months down the line. The leg is still protected, and as you can see that the bone is showing reactive changes. So this is by no means a normal bone. Okay? Tibia is a weight-bearing bone, just as the femur. So you really need to be careful about uh, protecting the limb, because allowing the child to weight-bear or aggressive physiotherapy can have disastrous consequences. Despite our protection, this is how it turned out to be. Four months down the line, you can see that the proximal tibia uh, is starting to kind of break, give way. Five months down the line, you can clearly see that there is a discontinuity there. Okay? So we did counsel the fam family at this stage that they may need for surgical intervention. So how many of you, a quick raise of hands, would want to do something at this stage or would want to wait? Those who want to kind of do now anything now, up. Those who want to wait, okay, but wait, that's a good answer, continue protection, okay? So seven months post-surgery, still not looking good, protected. By, by now, the knee brace had been changed to a, uh, uh, freeing up the knee, uh, like a patella tendon brace, not allowed weight bearing. So there is no rush to intervene in this. As you give time, a lot of them, the body reacts to it, the body tries to self-heal and you have plenty of time to go back and intervene. If it remains as a non-union or a, a discontinuity there, you're better off tackling it when the bone is a lot more healthy. Okay, so that's further down the line. This is a lockdown picture and so the, it was sent, done remotely and sent across and you can see it's gone on to heal very well. And that's three years down the line without any intervention. So, so the first thing that you need to remember in, in these fractures is to kind of allow nature to intervene. The worst possible time is almost like a second hit, and it's, it's the case which was, which was uh, done yesterday, the fem femoral, fract femoral gap non-union. After the acute infection is controlled, and during the next three months, if you uh, do a second insult with surgical insult, the bone just melts away and disappears, and then you're always playing catch up. So allow nature to kind of Take care of things. And I want to illustrate this with another case. Here is a five-month-old, very young child with septicemia, came in with uh, uh, an osteomyelitis of the humerus with an abscess. Limb was protected after the surgical drainage. And you can see ghastly x-rays when you see one month down the line. And if you mistake this for ongoing acute infection and want to jump in and do some surgery, debride and things like that, do not waste your time with advanced investigation. Go with clinical and lab parameters. If the acute infection is controlled, the body is trying to heal. Look at the x-ray two months down the line. There is no humerus and you're worried about it. What's going to happen? Just protect it. Give it time. Okay, that's four months down the line. It's a small baby, so there's no rush to intervene. Let the bone heal up. It, you may still, I'm not saying that all of this will go on to heal, but there's nothing to be gained by jumping in and, you know, doing early aggressive surgery because you have a lot to lose and very little to gain. You can see the MRI has confirmed a discontinuity because we were th contemplating that this may need surgery if it does not. But plenty of time, counsel the patients. You can see at six months post drainage, there's a clear discontinuity. What would you do at this stage? Intervene now. Hands up. Wait and watch. Okay. 
Yeah, there's nothing to be, you're not losing anything by waiting and watching. Yeah? So, a couple of months down the line, you can see it's going on to heal. Okay? So that's one year down the line. So these are learning. So one of the important things about follow-up is that you learn from your cases and you kind of get your own experience about these courses kind of illustrate, you know, what can go wrong when you jump in aggressively and, and do things. That's, look at from where, if you recall where we started, that's like almost two years down the line. There's absolutely no problem. Had protracted brace protection, even though it was a non-weight bearing limb, just a simple plaster molded splint. Okay, so the first message that I want to kind of drive home in this is identify the risk factors, and I'll come to that. Prevention is always best, so in addition to your surgical intervention, make sure that you protect it. Do not be in a rush to intervene in a post-infective scenario. Let things calm down, give it time, and you have plenty of time to plan your surgery, and you probably may have only one chance to intervene, but make sure that you time it well. So don't be in a rush, don't interpret these images, uh, in, as persistent infection that you need to aggressively debride and stabilize and things like that, okay? Because you will see the bone melting away. So in terms of risk factors for pathological fractures, there are things which you do not have any control over, the bacteriological, we're more virulent the organism. Obviously, there is going to be, uh, you know, risk of fracture. Clinical, more florid the clinical signs, again, high risk of fracture. In terms of radiographs and imaging, more extensive infection, Radiographic changes which show more than 45% at six weeks, that's on plain radiographs. If you have an initial MRI, which most, most of us would do in an acute infective scenario, if you have a near circumferential um, abscess or a very narrow transition zone, they are high risk for fractures. So bear that in mind. This is a very useful book. Lots of us have contributed to this book. It's a multi-author book uh, which covers pediatric musculoskeletal infections quite well. So if you can look it up, it's quite good. It covers pretty much the full spectrum. So here is another scenario wherein is a three-year-old with an infection which was almost four months prior. So this is how the child presented with no active signs of sepsis clinically or radiologically. Okay, but there you can see there's a large sequestrum. All clinical markers are well controlled, had been on antibiotics for a good two months. So this is where you see. Now this is a huge sequestrum. Okay, what are you going to do at this stage? You could protect it but it's going to take a lot of time for that sequestrum to get resorbed and the involucrum to form. So these are your options, okay? By all means, you can protect it, but it is going to take a long time for it to get resorbed. This is a persistent focus of infection. That is a big piece of bone, almost about 15 to 20% of the tibial length, okay? But if you remove that piece, you need to stabilize it, okay? You need to stabilize, you need to think how you're going to stabilize it. Are you going to fix it internally, externally? How are you going to manage that gap? All of those things come into the picture. So this is one way of doing it. I'm not saying this is the only way. Excise the fragment. You don't need to do an aggressive debridement. Put in fibula struts to get the biology right, but more importantly, get your mechanics right. The child can almost weight bear on this. So the reason for intervention in this case is that's going to take a long time, protracted morbidity for that sequestrum to get resorbed. So where you think it's going to be a, leave a large gap, take it out, put a fibula there. Okay, so that's her going down the line. That's just before frame removal. And I think I have a follow-up at one year. You can see how she's doing well. Okay. So my last case again, here the take-home message here is if you have a gap after your sequestrectomy, even in a semi-acute, sub-acute situation, make sure that you get your biology and mechanics right. Not just biology, bear in mind the mechanics. So here is another one, an eight and a half year old, acute osteomyelitis in the femur, notorious for stress fractures, especially after drilling holes, okay? Had drill holes, fracture, the treating surgeon stabilized with elastic nail, went on to fail. I don't have any of those pictures. Revised to plate with bone graft, ended up with this. The child had not been weight bearing for almost six months. Never united. No active signs of sepsis. So what are you going to do at this stage? The implant is failed. There's no union. You have to remove it. You're going to excise the segments. You have to consider, are you going to fix it internally, externally, plaster? If you debride it, what are you going to do with the gap? Are you going to graft it, transport it? How are you going to manage the length, the knee stiffness? Child had almost a 30 degree flexion deformity at the knee. Are you going to do it stage simultaneous? So these are things which you need to plan before you jump in, 
okay? And there are many ways to do it. When you went in, this is the status of the tissues, okay? What we chose to do was do a masculine induced membrane, which is not well published, not extensively published in the pediatric, this thing, especially in an acute infection context, but there's no active infection here. That's the gap, stabilized with a rush nail, with a cement spacer. That's when, six weeks down the line, when we plated it, preserving the membrane. That's him, six months down the line, starting to weight bear. And that's almost a year down the line, doing very well. His once a flexion deformity was corrected and he regained some length, the length discrepancy was much lesser. Family didn't want any intervention at this stage, more than happy with leaving things as they are with the shoe raise. So one of the things that you need to remember with these interventions is when you are intervening in all these cases, because it's a long journey, plan your intervention, you need to preserve existing function and anticipate future surgeries. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.